So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me to uh, come to this conference. Um, as uh, Simon was saying, I'm uh, currently in charge of the uh, MBA programs at the Rotterdam School of Management at Erasmus University. Uh, so I'll be here somehow with uh, multiple roles. Uh, first of all, in equality as a, a person in charge of an educational program, an MBA program. We have two programs. We have about uh, 300 students enrolled in our full-time and executive MBA programs. So I'll be sharing a bit of those experiences with you. On the other hand, as an academic and as a lecturer on the field of leadership and organizational behavior, I'll be sharing with you also some of my findings from my research as well, hoping that that will say um, uh, help us in this in this dialogue. And on the other hand, also as a father, so I have three children of my own, so I'm very much concerned about the education they have and um, how our educational system should change and develop uh, to make them, if you want, also more servant-like leaders. Uh, so the title of my presentation actually says it all, I guess. Um, uh, I guess I will try to end with my suggestions about how we should go about developing the servants uh, aspiring to lead. Um, and I hope that uh, by uh, outlining uh, how I look at servant leadership and how I look at education, we can come to some form of dialogue about that afterwards. So, <clears throat> when uh, Simon asked me to, to come and speak, here I was wondering, okay, what should I tell? <laughs> And people come here all the way from all different kind of places to, to, to listen to some something smart. So I need to say something smart. So I went into to the Greenleaf um, writings and I found this, this interesting piece uh, from his original writing that actually already back then in the 70s pointed out to the um, challenges of education and how much schooling and education was actually becoming more and more as a social upgrading mechanism that was destroying community rather than, rather than a, an instrument to develop um, responsible citizens. Um, and he talks about these two words that I think I can uh, relate to from what I see. Many people, many students, many young people in schools, this alienation and lack of purpose, this sort of void, this distance from everything, right? So they go through the motions, they, they, they go through life without actually feeling engaged and feeling responsible or committed or even caring about what's going on in the world. Of course, with a few exceptions, we still have a lot of people uh, that are very committed, but there's it's a sense of alienation, maybe more in the Western societies that, um, that I experienced. I have no empirical data to, to, to back it up in terms of how many of these actually are feeling alienated versus those who don't. But I definitely see a sort of distance from, um, from school, distance from community, distance from feeling a sense of purpose. Um, so I, I took this as a basis, and I, I guess we could all say relate to this challenge in schools and education nowadays. Uh, so here's my own, maybe not so original, thinking about it, um, and why I think that um, we might be facing this sort of alienation in schools and education in general. Uh, first of all, the thing that it, it strikes me the most is this huge emphasis on, on success. I have a career of financial success, right? We're going to school and we as parents tell our kids because you need to get a job and you need to make money and you need to be someone out there. If you don't have it, you're lost, right? But we see it very much as an instrument to be successful in our society rather than really a place to learn and to develop as a human being or as a citizen. Um, uh, as an extension of that, you see schools becoming more and more of a status symbol, especially in certain Western societies. I mean, if you belong to a certain school, you're part of some form of elite uh, group that can afford to think and lead others, uh, as opposed to if you're just from a normal school, you can. And it's probably mostly true in the US. Um, and there was actually a, 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 a recent article in, in The Economist talking exactly about that where they point out how the educational system in the US is becoming very elitier Ill and actually not allowing, not very, becoming very democratic in that regard. So this links very naturally to the third point. By having a system like that, basically we are not being very fair to those who cannot afford uh, private education um, in, in, in those most private schools. Then what I also observe is that um, 
this course uh, tend to be, because of lack of resources, because of the lack of time, because of the lack of teachers, um, more and more isolated from community and society. And that goes both from in terms of students interacting with community and society, but also the teachers themselves being so far uh, often detached from community and society. Right? Uh, very much focused in their, in their classes, the program they were, uh, were given to teach, making sure that the students pass their exams, rather than really trying to integrate what they're learning with what is happening out there. The other thing I observe is often the poor integration with parenting. Uh, many times parents see school as a replacement for education instead of a, a complement to education. Um, and schools also lacking um, or not being uh, very proactive in reaching out to parents to, um, to make sure that uh, it's integrated. Um, the other thing I see is um, that teaching is essentially cognitive, uh, very much focused on uh, subjects, uh, very cognitive subjects, uh, memorizing things, uh, and very little on creativity, social or emotional skills. Um, very much classroom based, very little experiential learning, and there's a still a strong emphasis over, uh, uh, on the respect for authority rather than the respect for ideas. Of course, being in the Netherlands and having my children in the Netherlands, my oldest is 14, so he's, he's in a secondary school and he's, he's very much, very vocal. So he goes to the director all the time, he complains about this, he complains about that. But he's expected in the Netherlands to be like that, so it's, 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 it's respect. But I can assure you, in Portugal where I come from, I would not be seen as a very, very uh, uh, positive trait, right? You should shut up and listen to the teacher, to the director. I like the fact that he's a bit of a maverick and goes and complains and as long as it's an, on a reasonable basis uh, because that develops their ability to think, to critically think. And I don't think schools provide enough ground for students to do that. So if I add all this up, and of course I'm not being entirely fair because many schools don't do this, right? They do exactly the opposite. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, this is not a very fertile ground to develop certain leaders. Um, it's probably the opposite of all these aspects that we need to uh, pay attention to. And this goes for both schools and higher education, in my opinion. Um, so, but of course, maybe we need to come to terms on what sort of leadership any is anyway, right? So that we kind of agree on that. So I'd like to also develop a bit on that, and from there then try to make sense of how I think um, education could change in that regard. So servant leadership is, of course, and I'm, I have a very tough audience because you probably know more than me, but um, maybe I can share my views on that, on servant leadership. It's actually not a very, very new concept. I mean, it's been there for hundreds of years, even in the writings of Lao Tzu. You could already see signs and traits of you know, this idea of the leader uh, being in service of others, of, uh, of a humble leader, a leader that allows others to take the stage and take initiative but was indeed recovered by briefly in the 70s. Um, and and the, basically, when we talk about servant leadership today, we are referring essentially to Robert Greenleaf's writings and original thinking. But um, the thing that strikes me the most, and of course, as an academic, I've studied many types of leadership models, transformational, transactional, authentic, uh, uh, empowering, uh, complex leadership, all kinds of leadership models you can imagine, the thing that keeps coming back, where it really makes a striking difference with every other model you see, is this notion of the servant leader is servant first. Anything else, behaviors you can see there in terms of uh, empowering others, uh, uh, focusing on developing others, you see that in different uh, models. Right? Transformational leadership also talks about that. The key difference, if you want, conceptually and philosophically, is this notion that the servant leader is servant first. And that determines how I look at uh, the approach that we should use when developing servant leaders. Of course, if you are a servant first, it means that it needs to be based on a deep sense of humility, right? So the humility and, uh, and, 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 and taking a... a um, um, more of a, a back uh, type of seat in, 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 when leading is, is really important. Um, and this model actually tries to encompass the, uh, how servant leadership can look like. So Dirk van Dierendorf is a part of the Erasmus University. He, uh, at the Center for Leadership Studies, has been developing far more work on servant leadership. 
And in the last 10, 15 years, you see a lot of empirical evidence coming out, um, uh, say, proving the effect of servant leadership in different contexts. Uh, and this model basically outlines uh, this empowering, developing aspect of, of servant leadership. This humility trait, again, very much based on this need to serve, which is basically clear that all of that's in the left. Uh, authenticity, the personal acceptance, provided election, stewardship, a bunch of things, I won't go into detail on that. Um, and apparently there is a case for servant leadership because the, the studies we've been doing actually prove that it increases, it improves the relationship between the leader and the follower. It creates a positive uh, psychological plan of organizations, which in the end turn out to uh, be actually quite effective in, in leading to profits, um, shareholder value, stakeholder value, all these things, right? So in doing the right thing, you actually end up making money as well, right? So, so that seems to be a business case for servant leadership, um, but there seems to be also other work still to be done in how to develop servant leaders. So um, these are some examples of servant-like leaders, but I won't uh, spend much time here. I just know some examples ourselves. Um, but um, I'd like to show you uh, very quickly two studies that we did at RSM on servant leadership. Um, as it was said in the beginning, uh, it is important to go deeper into what servant leadership is. Where does it work? Where does it not work? Uh, which contexts are may be more appropriate or not for servant leaders? So we went down into studying how can servant leadership be applied in different contexts, right? One of the studies we did was on this interplay between what we call this moral or virtuous side of the servant leadership, focused very much on this need to serve, which is based on a deep sense of humility and standing back. How does that interact with that action side of the leader? Right? Because at the end of the day, being humble and standing back is important for your motivation to serve, but it doesn't get you anywhere unless you take action, right? So there's an action side to servant leadership that you need to also to have. And actually Greenleaf talks about it himself in his original writings. A servant leader takes initiative. A servant leader says, I go, who comes with me, right? So he takes action. He inspires others for that action as well. So we wanted to see how these two aspects interact with one another in generating engagements among people. And we wanted to see how that further interacts with actual the position of the manager. So in terms of where the manager stands in the ranking, senior manager, junior manager, things like that. Right? So we went to and studied did a study with about uh, uh, more than 200 people, and these different scales didn't matter so much. But one of the things we found that was quite interesting was that um, uh, for people in higher ranks, managers in very high positions of authority, first of all, sorry, humility always works. Right? So if you're humble and competent, so if you perceive as being competent and at the same time humble, you as a leader are always more effective in generating engagement. But when you are in a high rank position, what it means is that actually when you are competent and a leader, it amplifies your ability to engage others. So there's a, 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 a catalyst effect, if you want, of humility which comes very close to this level five leadership, strong will and humility, just amplifies the respect you gain from others. At the middle rank, humility still played a role, but there was no amplifying effect. And it's interesting to see at the lowest ranks, uh, humility could help, but you could get away without humility if you were seen as very, being very competent. So maybe not exactly the nicest guy in the room, but you're technically very competent and you get things done, and you can get away without being humble. You can compensate for the lack of humility. So there seems to be a, an even higher effect of uh, uh, servant-like leadership at the higher ranks. So the higher up you are in the position, if you can be humble, the more powerful you can be. Of course, being competent goes without saying. You need to be seen as being competent. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how humble you are. So this is the first um, uh, finding that we see that servant leadership might be actually particularly Suited, particularly powerful when you are in a position of power. Right? So that's uh, one of the findings we got. Um, one of the other findings of the studies we did is looking at how servant leadership leaders look at themselves versus how others look at them. 
so we asked servant leaders to rate themselves as leaders. Uh, so it's a bit of a paradox because if you're humble, you're not supposed to say that I'm very good as a leader, right? Um, and now others look at the servant leaders. So we, we had these diets of managers versus uh, followers, and we tried to understand how that uh, um, happened. Uh, traditionally, this, the literature was saying that when the leader is in agreement with the follower, meaning that I think I'm good and the follower thinks I'm also good, usually this predicts a, a good leadership because it's a sign of self-awareness. So therefore, you, you're likely most effective. So we went to search and, and our hypothesis was, for the case of servant leaders, is actually the underestimators who actually perform better as servant leaders because they will tend to underestimate themselves compared to how others see them. And uh, we went to do that research and we actually found that indeed that um, in our case, those people who were underestimated their own capability as a leader, they were still seen as good by the others, but they thought they were not as good as the others thought they were, predicted more, in our study, they were, uh, this finding predicted more uh, the ability to generate psychological empowerment compared to the high in agreement score and compared to overestimators. And of course, if you think you're not good and everyone else agrees, then you're not very good at all, right? So, and our findings concur with that. So there seems to be, indeed, servant-like leaders are humble. They underestimate themselves. They put more value on others rather than themselves. Our findings seem to confirm that. And you might wonder why we still have overestimators there. But you see that the servant leader has different traits, right? So some of them are very close to the core and the essence of being a servant. Humility, standing back, authenticity. Other traits are common to other types of leader, leadership. Setting direction, setting targets, making people accountable, right? If you score really high on those, you score on high on certain traits of leadership, to, that do not contribute necessarily to the notion of servant leadership, but might make, might make you still effective in certain contexts. And we hypothesize that these are overestimators. So not very humble, but still effective in getting results at a cost of something, right? It's always a cost. Maybe at a cost of fulfillment, cost of engagement, cost of something else. Um, so just to give you, I thought it would be nice to give this sort of um, more empirical data, and I have other studies we can share. Uh, the first one, by the way, was just published at the Journal of Business Ethics, so um, I'm, I'm, I'll be more than happy to uh, distribute that afterwards. Um, so what are the conclusions we can take from the empirical data we have um, and uh, the, the, the research we've been doing? Um, first of all, a servant leader is servant first, right? So if you want to know what makes servant leadership unique from any other model of leadership, it is notion that the initial motivation is there to serve and only then to lead. But the aspiration to lead comes afterwards. And as Greenleaf has said himself, that makes all the difference. Because if your first initial aspiration is to lead, they will change your attitude, your behavior, everything will be different. Um, being a servant is an act of humility. Right? So this is where the humility comes into play. Because you as a servant, you see yourself as one among others, and you're there to, at, at the service of others. And that's an act of humility. Um, but at the same time, a servant leader, otherwise only a servant, a servant leader, acts upon that motivation and takes a leading role in, in, in making a difference, and in, in, in moving, in making, creating movements, in motivating others, in inspiring others to, to, uh, to support him. Um, as we could find, humility can actually work as a catalyst for effective action. So when you're competent, when you're good and you're still in action, and you can stay humble, it amplifies your ability to motivate others. Um, and often they go unnoticed. And this is a challenge in organizations that, you know, we have all these sort of instruments to detect talent, develop leadership uh, talent, but it's very much focused on uh, probably promoting extroverts, very vocal about their achievements, but maybe these are not the people you want to promote. Right? So that's a paradox because the people you promote in organizations may not be the ones we need, uh, uh, especially at the top. Right? So knowing all these things, how do you go about educating people to become servants 
capable of leading. Because the starting point should be there. Because if you start off with the leadership part without focusing on the servant part, you're developing leadership, leadership skills, but not servant type leaders. So, um, the key thing then is to start off with finding a motivation to serve. And it's invariably, every time you ask about an example of a servant leader, there was a moment, there was an experience that led them to aspire to serve. I had the pleasure of meeting a banker boy, he was the founder of the Barefoot College in India, and basically this is a college that doesn't require you to be able to read, it's just all right. He just went, uh, goes into small villages in, in, in India and actually uh, teaches uh, grandmothers how to build solar panels. Because with those solar panels, they can have electricity, with electricity, can have light, or students teach. This guy came from a very affluent family in India. He was predestined to become a world leader. He was a, also a, a very good squash player, by the way. And one day he went into the villages just because he wanted to take some time off before going into business as usual. And he saw something that changed his life. There was a humbling experience that allowed him to connect to the harsh reality of his people, and then he aspired to lead for that cause. So if you want to have people with the motivation to serve, my personal opinion is that we, can, we, we need to start there, in creating experiences, humbling experiences, that connect people to the ground, that connect people to the harsh reality of the world out there, and then helping them making sense of what that means for their personal life. The problem is that we have schools who do that, we have universities who do that, but they don't anchor it, they don't close the loop. So what does that mean? Right? Often you see students going to this sort of community work and they come home, so they go, eh, it was nice. Because the school moves on, it doesn't close the loop, what does it mean about you? Right? So you need to work with people people to understand the values and the purpose behind it and help them define a purpose around it. That purpose can change, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, one day you think you want to save children in Africa, the next day you want to do something in your company, it doesn't matter. It's just developing that muscle of that motivation to serve it. it's very important that you think, critically think about what's going there, going out there and asking my questions. So just a note on where humility comes from, it literally means earth. Right. I like this term because humility means connecting people to the earth, to the ground, to the basic things. And we spend too much time about concepts, and theories, and, and fancy new philosophies. But at the end of the day, if you want to have certain leaders, you need to bring them down to earth, to where it hurts. Right. So this is my, my very first step. At the other side, we have something in place that kind of um, comes close to this. We have these township projects in, in South Africa, so we go to Johannesburg and Cape Town, and we force MBA students to um, to deal and help local entrepreneurs that have to, you know, live on you know, a dollar a day, um, and, and and seeing how much they they contribute to the local community, helping them moving away from all those grand theories they they, they were taught during the MBA, and being connected to their very hard reality. And many times they come out inspired and they said, I'm going to change my life completely. I found a, I found a purpose, I found a vocation. Because not, not always. Right? We don't aspire to turn everyone into that. But it works a lot you know, with, with, uh, with three people. And um, uh, we still need uh, to do a lot to improve this program, but it's, it's, it's working in developing a sense of humility, in developing a sense of purpose. Um, the second time, tough thing is now, okay, now you find a motivation to serve. You need to find an aspiration to lead. Right? Oh, I feel humble. Oh, wow, I was very sad. Let's go and have some fish and chips, right? Now, you need to decide to do something about it. What do you do? Right? So that's the motivation to lead. So now I've seen it, I've experienced it. It had an emotional impact on me. So how do I go about building a vision such that I can make a difference? Right, so that's the thing that we should do next, is having these people talking with certain type of leaders, having them experience taking initiative in small projects, taking a leading role in small projects, where can they actually contribute, and helping them developing a vision around that sense of purpose. And that's the synthesis, right? Create an experience, but if you don't synthesize that experience, it just stays there floating. You need to anchor somewhere. And RSM, again, we have a project that um, kind of resembles this. I'm, don't, don't misunderstand me, I'm not trying to sell it RSM does 
uh, servo leadership type of uh, development. We don't. I just taking examples which are not yet integrated to see how this could be done. One of the things we do there, it seems to work quite well, is to help students formulate a purpose, formulate a vision. And they have this I will statement, this photographer who comes in, they prepare this I will statement based on a series of workshops, and they put it uh, in, a, in a nice photo. And this is actually put on Facebook, on posters throughout the whole campus. So if you visit RSN, you will see pictures like this everywhere from staff, from students, everyone. Because this creates a sense of accountability. Oh, I told the world I was going to do this. I better do something about it, right? We have actually empirical data demonstrating that uh, drop offs reduced and uh, uh, the results have increased academically since we introduced this. Because suddenly they realize ah, by the way, this education actually has a purpose, right? It can help me achieving my vision, right? A lot of times people get into the program and they don't know why they're doing it in the first place. Why, why, why am I here? My parents told me I need to get a master's degree. Right. All right, so what? So we, with this exercise, we hope to formulate that vision. Um, and finally, developing the leadership skills you need. Skills, not a motivation. So there's clearly a difference between skills and motivation. The skills is where we all do this already for years, right? We've been training them how to speak, how to convince them, to negotiate, whatever. But we think that those leadership skills can be far more um, uh, impactful if that leadership development is done in the context where people are challenged, not just intellectually, but also emotionally and physically. So we have an example of the Women in Leadership Project in Kilimanjaro. We actually bring women from our MBA program, another master program of RSM, to climb the Kilimanjaro. And with that, we're developing a whole set of skills and traits that are very close to servant leadership. First of all, it's courage, right? Because being a servant leader is not easy, because you probably embrace a cause that other people might, may not even realize. So you need to be, have the courage to, to say, I'll do it, right? So in, in going to Kilimanjaro, you need to be very brave, especially because you need to go through a very intense <coughs> training of three or four months. No smoking, no coffee, physical training, um, it's going to be tough, and it is tough. Authenticity is very important because you need to, you know, you need to let go of your defenses. You need to accept that you might not be able to do it, and many of them don't finish it. So it takes a lot of courage also to admit I failed, but in that process I succeeded as well, right? So authenticity and courage is one. Being a steward. Why are we doing this? Why is it important? Empowering others is a team effort. Many people want to give up halfway, but really we're all in this together. So we, we, we will try to push our limits together. We go to the top. Setting direction, of course, I guess the peak is probably here. But accountability, I promised my fellow team members I'm going to go for the Kingdom and I'm going to do my absolute best to go to the top. So with this sort of emotional, cognitive, and physical experiences where you put people at the front, you really allow people to develop the skills that you need. We're now thinking of doing something similar with the sailing. So we really have a very demanding sailing experience where you need to again work as a team and develop the skills to be out there. But you need to be in the unknown. Because classroom-based leadership development, sorry, but that's this is why companies come to us and say, well, you know, they, we need to do everything from the beginning. Right? They cognitively understand it. It doesn't mean you can do it, right? I can look at a bicycle the old day, it doesn't mean I can bike. You need to cycle, you need to fall a few times, you need to try again, hurt, you know, you get hurt, right? It's the same thing with leadership skill. You cannot practice just by listening to someone like me talking about it. Right? So experience-based learning is, is critical for us. So the first step, developing a motivation to service, to serve through humble experiences. The second one is developing the aspiration to lead, the belief that you can actually make a difference, to avoid that alienation people have, and the third is developing the skills to do it, knowing that this is an ongoing process, you will never end. So this is my very shy attempt, if you want, of, uh, of um, uh, how I would suggest to go about developing servant-like leaders, um, and I'm maybe not so original actually in the beginning to start with, because if we go back to the 5th century, St. Augustine already said that, right? So, we wish to rise, begin by ascending. The planet power of the clouds, 
lay first the foundation of humility, and it's exactly where you should start if you want to develop servant like leaders. Thank you. Uh, in part, in to servant leadership, because one of the challenges that we've been facing with servant leadership is a lack of empirical research. So now we're breaking new ground with um, developing uh, the foundation of servant leadership based on research. So this is a very important uh, breakthrough, and it really found your uh, talk really inspiring, and I gave a lot of ideas to So we really appreciate that, uh, both. Thank you for that.